to our we debate here this evening um, between uh, Dr. Paul Spooner and uh, Mr. Ikile. Um, topic, should hate speech be legislated? Um, uh, just a little bit about us and about the event. We're Shalom Students Association. We're an organization, well, they're just like, see. Uh, we're an organization uh, basically representing an open forum for democratic and fair and open discussion for um, mostly issues related to um, Israel, Palestine, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but recently we've diversified um, and we're taking on a range of different matters um, of public interest and of interest to um, people who are interested in these sorts of things. Alrighty. Um, just thank you to Victoria for hosting us. Thank you to my fellow um, uh, event organizers uh, for all the for all the work going into uh, this evening's events. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I thought I'd, I'd give two quotes that I think represent the two sides of the table um, that many of you will be familiar with. Um, firstly, the somewhat ubiquitous Evelyn Hall quote, this attributed to everyone from Barack Obama to Churchill to Voltaire to Thomas Jefferson, I believe, as well. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. You've probably all heard that one come around when, ele when election time comes about. Um, and it's a very strong sentiment. And it probably represents um, a good deal of what uh, Mr. Ikele has to say this evening um, and what he'll, uh, and the fight that he'll be supporting. In terms of uh, Mr. Spoonley, a quote that he'll be familiar with because I pulled it from one of his lecture slides. Um, if we extend ultimate tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed along with the tolerance. Uh, and that's Karl Popper, one of my favorite philosophers. So um, a, a, a good deal to be said for both sides, and we're looking forward to getting into a really engaging and productive discussion this evening. Um, just some quick introductions. Professor Paul Spoonley is a distinguished professor uh, at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Massey University. Um, he does research on 21st century citizenship, uh, specializing in things like demography, migration policy, racial and ethnic, ethnic relations, sociology, uh, a massive research base. Um, he's a Royal Society Fellow. He's written or edited, uh, written or edited uh, over 25 books. He's a Fulbright Senior Scholar at, UK, uh, at uh, the University of California, Berkeley in 2010, and he was a recipient of the Royal Society of New Zealand uh, Science and Technology Medal in 2009. And then we have uh, distinguished uh, Mr. Ali Ikile, uh, Deputy Leader and Board Member and uh, Takanini Candidate for New Conservatives New Zealand. Um, Mr. Ikide has been a passionate defender of free speech, a right to hear, discuss, and express differing thoughts and ideas. Um, he is, uh, quote, committed to stopping the cycle of dependency that leads to disrepair in this country. Um, he lives in Papakura, South Auckland, with his family. Um, he's worked as a speaker, facilitator, and youth advocate. Um, once with the Ministry of Children, he was a community liaison manager at Villa Education Trust. And, uh, and a tutor at uh, Best Pacific in uh, Institution of Education. So wonderful CVs all around and uh, some really capable speakers that we're honored to have with us today. Um, just a quick introduction to our debate format. We're gonna be doing it in five minute segments, backward and forward, starting with Mr. Spoonley, going through rebuttals and secondary arguments. Uh, then we'll have a cross-examination period in which, the, uh, in which our arguments can interact with each other and we can uh, switch into more of a casual conversation format for about five, ten minutes and then we'll have our closing remarks. Um, again, that's five minute installments. I'll be gesturing to the gentleman when they have a minute, 30 seconds or so to go. Um, and then uh, we'll hopefully, if we have any time left, be doing the audience at the end. Um, so yeah, fantastic. All right, without any further ado, uh, this house believes that hate speech should be legislated. Uh, should house, uh, hate speech be legislated in a more casual air? Um, in the affirmative, we're beginning with um, Dr. Spoonley. Um, so thank you, Dr. Spoonley, and you have five minutes for your opening arguments and remarks. Thank you. Um, Elias has mentioned the Karl Popper quote. I want to start with that. I wasn't intending to. I was a student of Karl Popper's. And some of you might know that he escaped the Holocaust in Europe to come to this country and spent seven years here. During those seven years, he wrote one of the most important books of the 20th century, The Open Society and Its Enemies. But Carl was always very clear that whatever you needed to affirm in terms of democratic principles, there were some limitations. And I want to talk about 
what we might do in terms of those limitations today. And I think we've got a problem. And for me, that problem, the awareness of that problem, really only began a wee while ago. I began my work on the far right in the UK, on the National Front, way back in the 70s. And I've continue to do work on it, but, um, come on, <laughs> um, but when I began a few years ago to look at what was happening online, what I became aware of was the work by the Anti-Defamation League, that since 2015 and 16, what they've defined as being hate speech had escalated very significantly year on year. So the largest annual increase in anti-Semitic hate speech was 2017, which was then immediately beaten by in 2018. We are talking about um, 4.5 million tweets online in which Jews are targeted. The largest amount of hate speech concerns conspiracy theories around Jews, 12% about Holocaust denial and about a third to do with Israel. So what we're seeing around the world is a growing engagement with what's happening online in terms of the declining safety of groups, and I want to stick with the theme of anti-Semitism. So I began to do some work here, and I've, I'm, I'm continuing to do that work. I'm working with um, um, groups like Talmama in the UK. For me, there are three components of hate speech, and I'm coming now to my definition of it. One of them is the intent of the speaker. The second is the content of the speech. Neither of those are in and of themselves sufficient to define something as hate speech. So there has to be a severity threshold which needs to be met. And I think what increasingly I'm leaning towards is something which then encourages others to act in a way that is detrimental to the targeted group. And I actually believe that some of the definitions you can find on Facebook, YouTube, about attacks people on the basis of their protective characteristics are absolutely fine. Um, the UK has a motivated by hostility towards, and they've got some protective characteristics. But what we have one of the world's um, best legal philosoph philosophers, and a guy called Jeremy Waldron. And Jeremy argues that section 61 of the New Zealand Human Rights Act is actually a workable um, definition of hate speech. And the essential bit there is the intent to excite. I don't think they mean excite, I think they mean incite, not excite. Excite hostility or ill will or bring into contempt or ridicule a group of persons. So for me, we need to have a debate. We need to have a debate about the impact of hate speech on our communities. And if you've looked at the New Zealand research, particularly by NetSafe, you will see that there are some communities in New Zealand that are experiencing very high levels of hate speech. So you can tell from um, my position what I would like to do, and I welcome the discussion today, is to actually debate what it is we would define as being hate speech, and then the danger of that hate speech in terms of communities. And can I end up with what we've seen in New Zealand on the 15th of March, 2019, because that is the end result of hate speech. There is excellent research around the world which draws a direct line between hate speech online and actions. And so when we look at El Paso, when we look at the synagogue in Philadelphia, when we look at the mosques in Christchurch, we are talking about online radicalization people who've been exposed to hate speech and who then adopt the arguments of that speech and then go out and they kill people. So there's been some a very good work in Europe which has um, um, made that connection. And if I um, just put, uh, in, in terms of finishing, I think the escalation of hate speech, the amount of hate speech online, is destabilizing our communities and having an enormous impact on those targeted. And it is something that we need A, to understand, and B, to act upon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spoonley. Uh, Mr. Ikene, you have uh, five minutes for your uh, opening argument. Uh, 
Thank you so much for allowing us to be here to speak. It's a wonderful example of free speech. I'm just going to open my bottle. So, I am very honoured to be here. I'm very honoured that the Shalom community were able to bring us here. I'm also very honoured. I'm also very honoured to be sitting alongside Mr. Spooley. He is a very distinguished professor and it's quite a powerful thing to be alongside him. So I'm very much respectful and understanding of all that manner that's required in that area. Now, when I was first starting to think about how I was going to start my speech and how I was going to talk, one of the biggest things was I'm not an academic. I've lived and I've breathed the streets and I've worked for the last 20 years in youth work. That's everything from suicidal ideation, sexual abuse, child prostitution, the most, some of the most ruthless types of self-harm and attacks and brutality on other people. Uh, all the way up to building resilience programs and teamwork and leadership and articulation of young people themselves. So it's something which I've actually lived and worked in the field. I made the mistake of telling one of my good friends that I said, well, I'm not an academic. <laughs> she went off her rocker. <laughs> she basically said, first, uh, a version of bullpucker, you are an academic. You are an academic of the streets. How many academics have had people, young people, coming into their homes at 12 o'clock at midnight, 1 a.m., so that you can speak to them about pleading them not to kill themselves? How many academics have gone out into the streets and tried to get them off those streets, go into the gang houses, try to walk around the streets with them in terms of being able to discuss, to bring out the pain and struggles that they are, so that they do not engage in suicidal or further suicidal ideation? When we do think about uh, academics, how many academics have been in charter schools where I have been able to be right in there with the pastoral care and look after those young people, to sit down with parents, to sit down with both victims and offenders in various areas. And I did, I, I well, I did have to because she was about to jangle me over the back of the head. But I do, I acknowledge that she is correct. A lot of my knowledge and information, my study, has come around the reactions that we see coming on the streets. And if I backtrack that, we see that those are coming from policies built by theoretical models, by academics that are progressed by law through politicians. And so I am one of those who does not come from one end, I come from the other end. I live with the results of policies made, policies discussed, and policies passed. Now, I just wanted to give some real-world examples of something that I have spoken of, both in my professional and on social media, that have been labelled hate speech. One of them is, where is Dad? One of the biggest examples of growing hate speech that I have received, both in my professional career as well as social media, is, where is Dad? When I ask where is Dad, most often, or more often recently, we come into, I don't need no man. How dare you ask that question? I am offended. Usually comes with a few more colourful quotes, colourful discussions on that, but generally there is a desire to feel in professional services to shut down and to suppress the idea of asking where is the father of this child who's escalating the violent behaviour, sexual behaviour, who's starting to stab others, stab himself, steal bikes, steal cars and steal everything in between. Where is the father? And this is something which is extraordinary because this is one of those halo effects. Another one. This is one that John Campbell brought up. Trans women are men with dysphoria slash disorder to be treated with compassion and tolerance. For that, I was, of course, blocked from Twitter for a little while. Uh, and then I received a warning about being hate speech. During that time, by the way, I also had, was, uh, someone apparently attempted to dox me. And that was, of course, where they tried to give my student juice, my home juice. They failed miserably on that. They also went after my children. They also called out my practice of 20 years of in the field. When I've said best place for a young person to grow up in is a married mum and dad home, that gets assaulted online, social media, all the time. 
And in fact, in professional circumstances, we are starting to see that that is also being seen as being a bit hateful, being offensive towards those families who are not mum and dad, married mum and dad homes. We are starting to see it in, in professional practice, not only on social media. The last one that I like to use is when I was at an action station event, I said that the reason why prisoners have more Māori at Pasifika is because we commit the most crime. What you need to be asking is why do we commit the most crime? For that, I was slandered, I was attacked, and I was pretty much kicked out of that little action station event arena. And when I bring it up in professional circumstances, people do not want to deal with it. So when you do think about things that are legislated, hate speech, and I'm going to use air quotes a lot, what we're seeing is a dampening down of ideas, the ability to speak out problems, to seek and investigate what's going wrong in the elements of society, both at an individual and a community level. It is unacceptable to somehow legislate the very investigative reporting and discussions that we have. And I say this time and time again, that's why I'm on the other side, not this side. Thank you very much. Honourable, uh, thank you, Mr. Ile. Um, Mr. Spoonley, your uh, rebuttal plus 15 seconds. Plus what? 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> We're keeping a strict time here. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, can I start where Elliot finished, which is the we shouldn't be stopping free speech. I absolutely agree with that. I do not think that this society should operate in any way in which people are shamed or silenced. But I also believe that hate speech is part of the silencing. So for me, the question is not of the quantum of free speech because we're getting more free speech. It is where the boundary lies. And I would want to draw that boundary out to the edge of our public debates because we need to have these sorts of discussions. I would want them to be respectful. I would want them to be um, to engage with what has been said and with the evidence. But there's one thing that I think has been increasingly occurring in which I would take a slightly different view to the one that Elliot's proposed today, and that is that I think that Hate speech has been one of those areas which has been silencing groups in New Zealand. Now, interestingly enough, New Zealanders are in favour of hate speech legislation. Um, the research that's been done by Colmar Brunton, first of all, 30% of all New Zealanders have experienced hate speech online and 15% of them have been personally targeted by hate speech. And one of the things I would want to do if we were to move in the direction of legislating against hate speech is I would want to talk to those groups. And if you want to know what hate speech means to a New Zealander, talk to Sticks and Stones, the year 12 and 13 students in central Otago, and they will tell you a story about what it means for teenagers in New Zealand. So that's my first, um, that's my first point that I, I wanted to say. Oh, and I wanted to add that 68% of New Zealanders think that hate speech online is growing, and 74% of them support legislation. So there is a recognition that there is an issue, and that there is a willingness to think about hate speech. So I go back. The threshold for New Zealand has been tested. The Al Nisbet cartoons were taken to the tribunal, and the tribunal ruled while those cartoons were offensive, they did not breach the legislation as it currently exists. And so the minister is looking at that legislation. Um, Michael Bott, who is a, um, a rights lawyer here in Wellington, has said that the right to human dignity and freedom from discrimination shouldn't be subservient to free speech. And that's the debate for me, that if we want to affirm free speech, what does that mean in terms of the safety of members of our community? 
we're here tonight talking with the Shalom students. And we've just done a survey of the Jewish community in New Zealand. And they are one of the communities that is experiencing directly this increase in hate speech online. So one of the principles following what Elliot has said in terms of actual experience, one of my principles would be that you talk to people who are experiencing hate speech in order to get their perspective and to create, construct a policy, if not a law, that then pre prevents that hate speech having outcomes on them. Never again, and I'm sure we'll all agree, never again do we want 51 people killed in this country. And unfortunately, those were not the first deaths from white supremacist activities in the country. The Fourth Reich had killed three people previously, a gay man, a Korean backpacker, a Maori, uh, and so we need to acknowledge that this is not a minor issue for some communities, it really impacts upon their safety, and therefore it impacts upon our safety. One of the best, actually, that I've ever sort of stepped up and sort of debated, man, he's awesome. So I will actually go with, with a different tack, which is my area, because Paul's here and I'm here. So Paul always starts at the source area, I am always the person who deals with what comes out at the end. And so I will actually uh, take on that note, that actually, idea about internet usage of hate speech, the problems that we do see on, on uh, uh, hate speaking or, or young people who are attacking other young people and are bullying and all of those. Areas. It's something which I've worked in quite a lot in, in the schools, as well as the old head and the institutions that I've worked in. And it's quite interesting actually, but we have learned how to use hateful type of speaking, bullying type of thinking that is occurring in the online doctrine. And we're able to actually pull that out of people, bring in both the other person, bring them in, have a discussion, and time and time and time again, because we've been able to see the type of speech that is occurring, the type of bullying, we we're able to bring it out, discuss it with the young people, help them build resilience from it, and then actually come to a resolution between themselves. And that's one of the most powerful things by even saying that we shouldn't be trying to dampen or suppress free speech. We should be trying to instead work it so that we build our young people with resilience, train them and equip them on to handle the disgusting and the yuck stuff that will come out in life. By sheltering with a bubble, it will do nothing. Sorry, it will do worse than nothing. It will lower resilience and it will increase suicide rates. In actual fact, we've been seeing a lot of that. Nihilism is increasing, and what we see is that every single time someone gets bullied, if we do not step in and then look at the angles and the discussion, the communication going on, if we don't do that, then we lose it. And if we do do that, we make them stronger, we make them resolve, and who knows, in many of those instances, some of those young people who I've worked with have gone on to lead sustainably more healthy lives. That's the offender. That's the person who's doing the bullying. So I would say that's actually something of quite important in that. I also did want to bring up also the UN, and it's quite interesting how the UN, when they very first started in 1948, they did come up with the idea of free speech, freedom of expression, being able to hold whatever they believed to be right and good and, and wholesome, everything. And then they could allow for that discourse of ideas. Yet it was interesting that very recently, they've actually come down and now they're starting to shunt it down. As the, dem the democratic power changes and shifts within the UN, they seem to be changing their own ideas about free speech in terms of suppressing it. But for myself, I'm not sure from what I want. The coward, the Australian coward who murdered something like 51 people should never have been given a license at all. That's correct. So when we do think about the ideas about free speech and how it was actually hate speech or whatever it was that somehow led her to the murder of all those innocent people, it doesn't have to do with that. It actually has to do with the miserable failure and inadequacies of a system that was designed to stop or prevent people who had stupid or crazy or idiotic or most horrific ideas gaining a, a gun license. So first and foremost, we need to understand that that was actually the first horrible the first horrible uh, mistake and all of that. 
On top of that, we don't even know. We were not allowed to know because of the manifesto being blocked, because it is not allowed to be read. We are not able to actually read it and look at the stupid ideas and refute and then mock and then deconstruct those ideas. Yeah. The ideas of the manifesto yeah. are incredibly easy to deconstruct and to rip to pieces. They really are. I've read it several times before it was banned. It's a it's a pointless document. It really is. But it does give a sense of nihilism and false understandings of areas. And if we were able to get in there and discuss and engage in free speech with that person, radicalism would lower in him. By legislating the idea of hate speech, we make it so that these people will be hidden under barriers, under stones, running their own little way and getting worse and worse and worse. It doesn't help them. It makes it brutally underground. So yeah, that's what I would say in regards to that. Oh, I need to tell Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, we're running about three minutes ahead of time, so we're going to have a two, three minute uh, recess, so feel free to just talk amongst yourselves, and then we'll continue with a cross-examination period where our, uh, our two gentlemen will get to interact and, uh, and, uh, and investigate each other's opinions um, and make that space came out. Sweet. Thank you. See you in <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've been very, very impressed and happy with uh, the wonderful discussion that's uh, happened so far. Um, so for the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, and uh, we're going to be doing more of a, a casual interactive conversation. Um, so any kind of secondary rebuttals um, that uh, are wanting to take place, um, then we can just we can have a more of an interactive um, period. I'll be obviously adjudicating if, if anything gets a little out of hand, but I seriously doubt that's going to happen. Um, wonderful. Alrighty. Uh, so we can continue. Um, with uh, Dr. Spoonley, if he has any queries regarding um, the CQLA's um, questions, questions, questions. Uh, regarding, was it, was it, uh, yeah, like any, any questions regarding the rebuttal there? Well, I just, in the answer, is there any circumstances in which you could think of that somebody would be banned? Uh, beyond the different defamatory and the call for one? No, no, yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking of pedophilia. Uh, actually, an interesting one, yeah. So I know that on TED Talks they have this one where they try to say that there's a sexual orientation. I think it's despicable and disgraceful. However, I'm glad that it's out because it gives me the chance to engage with it and say that it's screwball and, and, and build exactly why it's screwball. That might not stop pedophilia taking place in the first instance, it might. If you, well, I mean, what will win? Well, Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, so I've been around the extreme right for a long time, and knowing the people but not knowing the Christchurch shooter, they're not amenable to debate. So I would fundamentally disagree with your view that somehow by bringing it into the light it would have stopped it. I don't think. I do recall uh, the incident of a young man who was, he was a little bit low in terms of a particular yeah. metric of, yeah. of thought, um, and he was actually very much in the far right. So what do you mean? <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> yeah. So he was, uh, he was very much in the far right, yes. and I remember uh, listening to a story, and in a story that he was uh, far right, he made friendships with some of the people that he regarded as being lower than him, because of the far right type activity that was going on, uh, that he was engaging in, and because of that discourse, over time, you realise that the philosophy of the ideology that he was following was just uh, foolish and absolutely uh, nonsensical. So, because of that sort of engagement with him saying, ah, you know, blacks are dumb, blacks are this, blah, 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 mm. he was able to actually be, become uh, de radicalised, I don't know what the word would be, but, but to, to come down to a nice uh, environment. Uh, interesting enough, well, I actually find that the far left are, are a lot more dangerous than uh, yeah. the yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 the far left are actually quite strongly uh, concerning in, in regards to where they come from and the fact that they want the state to control many aspects of life. And that does also include that the state will therefore uh, determine what you can and cannot say. So I find that to be really bad. Individual dickhead? Easier to sort of uh, destroy and to, to engage with. The state being the dickhead is a lot different and a lot more powerful, especially when you just read papers. Can I start now by saying that the 
been an exponential rise of swiftly and sustain and anti Semitism. I was, of course, talking about both left and right. Um, however, if you look at the FBI documents, if you look at the European Commission, if you look at the um, German uh, government department that's set up to look at it, then most of the contemporary terrorism, remembering that terrorism in countries like the US comes from domestic terrorism these days, not from international terrorism. So we've moved beyond that 9 11. Um, that most of the terrorist acts came from the right, not the left. Okay. Oh. 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 Uh, yeah, I think extremities on both parts of thought yeah. are, are quite dangerous, but by action. If you start to look at trying to shut down their ideas and their opinions and their thoughts, even if they're reprehensible thoughts, like the pedophilia, like the racism, then if we shut those down, then what we're saying is that, no, you go hide into a deeper corner, you make your plans in those deeper corners, you start to make your codes, your systems, and all those environments, I think they're quite dangerous. I would also go far, so far as to say that I think that things, for example, right now there's a real big push to say that Islamophobia is really big and we should be shutting down any speak of non Islamophobia when what we're doing is saying, hey, uh, if someone's actually stripping a bomb to their chest and blowing up innocent children and people, why don't we actually discuss that? People cutting off heads in the middle of uh, uh, English streets using knife attacks on, on London Bridge. I think we do need to be able to open up all of those for valid criticisms. And yet, in the environment that we see, we see that those are being labeled as hate speech and therefore should be suppressed religiously. Uh, thank you. Um, if we could just switch focus and if uh, Mr. Oh. Smoonley could. Uh, Sorry, if Mr. Smoonley wants to uh, require a question, uh, uh, Mr. Gillet, about uh, any of his, his remarks earlier. Um, in Me ask him? Yes. Oh, I thought that's what I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike, you say thank you. Sorry, we've. Uh, that's we've, uh, the last one. That's the last one. That amounts to the last thing okay. Elliot made. Okay, continue. Let's, let's go. Well, I, I mean, terrorism is terrorism, and I, I would, I would, I would want us to talk about it. left or right, anti-Semitic, um, uh, Islamic terrorism, whatever that terrorism is. Um, what concerns me really is the culture online which creates these views, ideologies, and then what then emerges in terms of our streets, which I think we both agree we want to keep safe. And so um, in terms of New Zealand, at this point in, 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 in 2020, you'd have to say, it's the right that is most challenging in terms of our public safety. <laughs> 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 oh, you jeez. I, I, I really don't. I really don't. Oh, well, 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 <laughs> let me uh, add on to that one. I'm, I'm not going to add on to it, but I would say to state that when I've got a young person uh, and they are in the streets of the south side uh, and they're actually doing it, what I need to do is to strengthen and make them resilient towards the attacks, both physical and also the peer, peer pressure for drugs, the online stuff to engage in and actually teach himself how to sort of techniques. So I find that in the real, in the reality of it, I've got to uh, uh, show it to them, to engage into that resilience, so that they have those trajectory, the, the bypass trajectory of going more positive by going down, feeling the pain and the struggle of it, then assisting them to come up, so that then when it occurs more and more, that doesn't matter. They are resilient, they are strong to it, and they can resist all of the, the disgusting stuff that will occur. Because again, every single person here increases in pain. We're going to go through deaths of our parents. We're going to. We're going to find a lot of pain and struggle in our lives. We've got to be able to make us resilient as opposed to shelter us from what is going to come in our world. I agree entirely with that, except that are there group are there not groups who who are not going to be sufficiently resilient because of they're going to be the subject of attacks of the sort that we've seen. 
Uh, do you mean, uh, it depends on the conflict or oil, I mean, all conflicts, but yeah. all, all people can either be protected or measured to a bit, so for example, got a young person who's, I don't know, I suppose got neurological sort of uh, bipolar sort of aspects, then that will require a, an external source of protection for that individual. What you don't want to do is to make a blanket statewide uh, banning for everyone to be nice to the one person for the time. Um, I think, can I? <laughs> no, 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 no. But see, I, I think we're having a debate about hate speech. In fact, I think the um, what's happening very rapidly is that um, the what's happening online is no longer um, going to be controlled by us. So if you look at Facebook and what it has did, I mean, 4.5 million posts concerning the Christchurch shooting, uh, Facebook's taken them down. So Facebook, tw Twitter, as you mentioned before, um, they're going to be the ones that exercise um, control over what's allowed online. And so we've got, I think, two problems. One is that this is international. So that whatever a country like New Zealand does is probably a limit to its effect. But the second is, it's going to be the platforms themselves which determine speech online. Yeah, but, you know, not countries, not you and I. Perhaps. I think there is something around the foolish and never such as the crisis and all that sort of like that. But, uh, I think in terms of the taxation and the difference between a, being a publisher or a platform, um, I, yeah, I mean, that's, I suppose that's a bit of a different argument. Uh, I think that, that we do need to engage, though. I, I love the idea because of uh, making sure that all speech is free speech. The great example I've heard it before was Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is actually not about black lives, they're actually about anti-Westernism and LGBTQIA plus ideology. They don't really care about black lives. But you oh, wouldn't know that yeah. unless you actually have to gain knowledge on the website and gain uh, the internet uh, talks on it, the online social media that they engage in, and also the factual historicity of what they have participated in and engaged in at a, at a larger level. Uh, that's the oh, okay. Um, well, I wouldn't characterise Black Lives Matter in that way. I mean, that's a, a difference between the two of us. Um, I think it's much more complex than that, as are most of the issues that we've been talking about tonight. And so reducing it to a single thing. So, for example, while I've argued that legislation is something we should consider in New Zealand or expansion of our current legislation, for me, legislation is actually the last step and that what we fail to do is teach our young people digital literacy. So what they see online, the misinformation, the echo chambers, um, the hate, is something that they can put into context. So the problem for me is self-radicalisation, which is what happened in Christchurch, which is what happened in El Paso, which is what happened in Philadelphia. And so there's that, there's that element, which is the, how do you reach out in terms of those people who are in their own little enclaves, who are talking to others, they're not listening to you and I, and they're probably not listening to a lot of people that are, um, you know, that are that are able to contribute to these debates. And so I think that's the issue for me. But what we then need to do is talk about community education, resilience. I agree with entirely, and digital literacy. And we need to, to talk, but we're not. That's not what's happening in our communities at the moment. So we have an issue. Wonderful. Okay, um, we'll take a minute, minute, minute and a half break, and then we'll resume for our final remarks. Thank you, guys. Alrighty. So we've had our two gentlemen agree that they've that they've said their piece um, for for and during the discussion period. So we're just going to have a quick ninety second, two minute closing remarks from both. Um, beginning with uh, Mr. with Mr. Ekin, I believe. The greatest culture in the world is Western culture. It is the one culture where freedom of speech is the cornerstone of that culture. It is the one that has been been able to correct itself. It is the one that has risen up to activity been able to take away all those things, or not take away, but have been able to engage in higher wage growth, productivity, quality of life, lifespan for all races. And the inequities and inequalities all there, but a nice upward trajectory. Now it's quite fascinating to me. Now I, I'm also going to say this carefully because I really like Paul. <laughs> so I, I'm saying this as a general umbrella, I'm not saying about Paul. But it's quite interesting to me that in Western culture, 
uh, at least from, from what I know, uh, that politicians and academics seem to be the most disconnected from real world living out of all types of people. Yet they contain and they control the very lives of our people through the progression of theory to law. Something which is always quite interesting to me. And uh, alongside that, so what I found was it was opposed free speech, or hate speech, but opposed free speech that led to women getting the vote. It was opposed free speech that yeah. led to the civil rights movement. It was opposed free speech that led to the abolition of slavery itself. And so it's a really important thing that we allow these types of free speech to come up because we've got to be able to call out things in our society as we see fit. No matter how yeah. controversial they may seem, Pedophilia was something that was brought up. I accept. I want it brought out. Yeah. Because I want to. I want to go against it. I want to debate it and smash it with my head. Come on. Metaphorically, straight to its teeth. Yeah. I want to destroy it. And so, one of the biggest things that I do know that hate speech laws and the ideas of suppression of free speech are coming by policy and core from politicians as they seek to apply their theory to New Zealand law. God bless you. God bless you. Um, in a few weeks, uh, my latest book will be appearing. Which is looking at the demography of New Zealand and the contemporary world. And I've, there's a couple of things in there that I've, I've stressed, and I want to stress here tonight. One of them is we're becoming much more international, despite what's happened in the pandemic. And the other is that we're becoming much more diverse societies. So in societies like New Zealand, there are some aspects of this country which have changed considerably in the last 20 to 30 years. We reached a million people in March this year, and we added that additional, uh, five million, we added that additional million people by migration. And so some of you here tonight will not be in favour of the levels of migration, and you might not be in favour of migration at all. But migration has made this country, and it's made a country in the 21st century, which is incredibly diverse. And so we need systems that allow that diversity to be represented in all of its manifestations. And one of the things that concerns me is that the moral right to express views and sometimes unpopular views, um, is not a moral right to silence others. And in that mix, that very difficult mix, are there hurt, are there hurts, is that such a word? Are there, are there things that are being done to people in our society, either that we're aware of or that we're not aware of, because of what the online provides us in terms of new ways of interacting with the world, of understanding that world. And so my closing pitch is to say, since 2015-16, apart from the demographic diversity that I'm talking about, we have seen this proliferation of what's happened online and its positive aspects, of which there are many, and its negative aspects. And so what concerns me most is somebody who spent 40 years looking at anti-Semitism, is that I'm experiencing a level of anti-Semitism and hatred which is unheralded in my lifetime. And some of that, some of that deserves the description of being called hate speech. And on behalf of the Jewish community in New Zealand and elsewhere, we should be standing up and saying, no, that is not acceptable. And legislation might be part of that, I think there are other things that we should be doing. But on behalf of the Jewish community in New Zealand, I want to be very clear that they should not be facing the level of hatred that they are at the moment. So you should that talk about it as Happened before the end. Anti-Semitism. Then you haven't been you listening know, to what I've said. I, mean, I have been listening to what you've said. You haven't brought it up. Nor have you brought up that I things know. are truthful. That people aren't allowed 
I started so by talking about the rise of anti-Semitism, and if you look at the Anti-Defamation League research on this, it is very, very clear. Happened before the internet. A big part of anti-Semitism is actually... All right, okay, okay. so this is obviously the start of a Q&A period. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Okay, can, can we please have one little last round of applause for our two guests? like to add on another note in terms of, you know, my perspective being here on behalf of Shalom Students Association. I think, you know, it's great to see such incredible cognitive political diversity in this room. And I think what we can all agree on is how wonderful it is to be here and to be living in a place and to be in an environment in which we can come together, all different backgrounds, all different opinions, discuss and debate these things in an open forum. And that's what Shalom is about, and we hope that uh, that's something that you all stand for as well. So thank you for that. It's, it is, uh... <laughs> hands. I saw this hand first. Uh, yes. Um... We've seen it with all forms of legislation, like the end of the war and through driving wars, that every time the state le legislated, legislated, does nothing, does nothing to stop the extreme behaviour that you were talking about, but all it does is target far less uh, damaging behaviour, like uh, targeting uh, people slightly out of the alcohol when they're driving a car, when the, the, when the alcohol landed there, so still they be virtually uh, unchanged. And I, I suggest what you are proposing will be exactly the same. You won't stop the Australian cow, another Australian cow from doing this too. What is likely to happen is that what happens in the UK under their hasty rules, that if you stand in a public place and read the Bible aloud, you face a risk. That's really what you want to do in the end. Oh, uh, I didn't hear a question no, there. No, 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 no. Please don't attribute that um, most of me. There's nothing I've said tonight, but that's what I've, you heard me say that legislation is, if we've got to legislation, then we've probably failed in terms of hate speech or hate no, crime. Hate was, no, no, yeah, I'm, I'm prepared to argue that, but that's part of the mix. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't make this the first step. I would want to talk about a whole range of things. And secondly, I would never take the 2005 um, religious and hate, uh, racism, hate crime act of the UK is an example of anything. You know, uh, legislating against hate speech. Yeah, and I would not, I would not use that. I would go to the Canadians. I think the Canadians have a much better model than the, the Brits. The Brits have made a farce of, of what they're doing. So you and I probably don't disagree on that. But I think there is good legislation around the world. I wouldn't go as far as the German stuff, which is much more extreme than anything else. Um, and it would be unacceptable in New Zealand, but I would go to the Canadians. All right, another question, preferably for Mr. Ipile. I can also we could refrain from uh, personal remarks and things like that. Hello. Hi, I have a question towards what you, you said to me earlier. Um, I might have heard but I'm pretty sure I've heard you refer to Black Lives Matter as a hate group. Um, and I would like to ask how you can say that you support freedom of speech, freedom of all speech, but at the same time, you are putting down that movement's right to speak freely on what they experience. So he's pretending what they see. Not what they no, he's calling it a hate movement. No, that's right. It's all the parents. So by calling it a hate movement, I would say that you are putting down the legitimacy of that movement and you are restricting their freedom of speech to actually express their experiences and express the, the inequality that they experience. Now so you know how we feel. How can you if, how can you be willing to say that all freedom of speech should be oh. everyone should be allowed to say as much as they want under freedom of speech, but at the same time say that it is a hate movement that Black Lives Matter is a hate movement. Do you legitimize what they are trying to say? Oh, no, 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 no. All right, no, I agree. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, no, don't talk all your all your bravery to uh, doing that. I saw you getting very angry when I say that. <laughs> so it's awesome, I love it. Um, uh, the reason being is the objective, uh, the objective evidence that's come out. So, for example, you do have things where they say that all cops are bastards, you know, the aid, aid caps and all over the place. You do have the fact that 
they actually uh, meet up with the VL and protest themselves, the ones who've been espoused very strongly, have actually gone out and assaulted many, and I'm doing brutal beating, brutal hidings. Not only that, you've also got that, that uh, we're just waiting for confirmation now, but I believe two BLM protesters are one of the ones, uh, two of the ones who've been arrested for uh, murdering some of the black people who actually died during the riot. Uh, alongside of that, you've also got the fact that they have uh, quite constantly, consistently, sorry, the other side of it as well, is that they, you find that they do not look after them. They don't go to the abortion clinic, the black people are killed many times. They don't go against gang violence, even though the number one death for black, young black men in America is the murder at the hands of the other young black men. They don't vote on that. So they, they not only have they shown that they are not a black, black white, they've shown that they've actually destroyed and hurt black life by the shops and the, the areas of commerce that they've taught to be owned by black lives, and the, also the physical assaults by the black lives, and not only that, also the attacking of police that have been filmed all over Twitter and feeds. They are a, they are a hatred because they engage in activities, objective activities that are hateful and violent. If you like, you can talk to me. I'm happy to ask you. So, according to us, no worries. Cool. All right, uh, can we have a question from Mr. Sterling, please? Yes, You're very keen, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and can this be phrased as a question, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well, okay. Well, Professor Smoothly talked about um, the Christchurch shooting and um, uh, it inspired the students of Australia. Um, and that set off a whole lot of initiatives by the government, draconian censorship, um, uh, fast tracking, un unfair um, gun laws, at the same time normalising police patrols. Um, police armed police going to the homes of um, law abiding citizens because they've criticised the government or because they, they were against the gun legislation. And all this creates a, um, a, fear, a, fear, a fear of deceit, okay? And I'm just wondering whether the, the, the we bring in um, strong hate speech legislation, um, our, sorry, the UK deception is that the police being an inordinate amount of time um, chasing up insults on Twitter. And so, um, are we looking at if um, a comparing uh, similar Ardern to Paul Pot or saying that men aren't women, is that going to bring an armed police response? Mm. And I think, that's, I think there's a genuine fear of deceit now because of the of, of, of the train of initiatives by the government since the yeah. um, Well, of course, the gun legislation was passed with every but one member of parliament in support of it. So well, you just sort of this might see it, can't you? Pardon? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, no, no. You, you, you talked about the gun legislation. Oh, well, the gun the legislation was passed by. So the support of every member of parliament. Well, it was amended, but it was, it was the way it was flagged. It was, it was brought in straight after the shooting. Yeah. yeah. Almost immediately. So I, I guess, I guess. At the same time as normalising police patrols, bringing in a. Um, it was the sanctity could be key. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, you're not allowed to answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, firstly, um, has dissent been um, um, attacked in New Zealand? I'm aware that the police certainly took a lot more notice of people who had been active on the um, media and who had been involved in gun debates and so on. And I think that was uh, a part of an immediate reaction to, to what had happened. The second question, that I guess, it would be back at you, and so I'll ask it as a rhetorical question, is that given what happened in Christchurch in March 2019, um, shouldn't we have acted in various ways to reduce the possibility of that occurring again? And so I think there was and has been wide support for what the government has done by and large 
Now, you might not agree with me because I mean, you, you see it in a particular way, but if you look at all the evidence, then there is strong support for what the government did around guns and around some of the police actions. Um, all right, this will, we are we are near the end of our evening. If people are willing to stay, uh, we will have one more question. Um, this gentleman here in the middle, um, Tripoli for uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, earlier on, the professor talked about the sticks and stones in central Otago. I can remember when I was a child, and that was just a few years ago. Uh, my mother said to me, that "Sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you." And uh, she also said, um, do unto others as they would do unto you and love your neighbour. These sort of, uh, these are pretty weird ideas, I guess. But is education better than legislation? That's the question I'd like to put to Mr. Blaine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. No, no, that's right. Every part of life, every challenge in life, uh, uh, comes with a learning and a resilience moment. So, so there's, there are some wonderful strands of psychological and neurological activity, especially within that first 16 years. Um, I think I'm going to go for a fast answer. Yeah. Legislation is, legislation is incredibly suppressive just by the nature of being legislated. Uh, so I think we need to not have legislation at all. Then. Education, short, sure. education, support, resilience training, uh, building, Families sticking together so that they have that natural, innate sort of resilience coming out. Uh, everything designed to, that is in nature designed to make someone stronger, able to handle the traumas of life is a great thing. Legislation takes away that ability. Okay. That's sort of been yes to. <laughs> <laughs> Please review the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, well, okay. Nice. Not okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we're going to end that there, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you all. Um, I'm not sure what these two gentlemen's plans are. Would either or both of you be willing to if you want some quick personal questions and answers afterwards, or if you need to go up to the individual gentleman, um, go easy on them. Uh, uh, they've had a tough time tonight, but they've, they've both spoken absolutely beautifully. Um, and thank you all for coming and thank you all for expressing your views and, and, and for participating in this public debate that, uh, that we value so highly. Thank you all once again. Thank you.